Welcome to the Courage to Be podcast with Tanya Vasayo. Before we get into this episode, I want to share with you that I'm on a mission to close the gender gap in the podcasting world so that more and more women's voices are heard. If you feel that this is something you value too, then please rate, review, and share the podcast. And in exchange, and as my way to say thank you to you, I want to give you free access to my signature course called Manifesting Abundance, which typically sells for $997. All you have to do to gain access is leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, take a snapshot of it, and send it to help, period, the courage to be at gmail.com, and we'll get you set up with access to the course. Welcome back to The Courage to Be, where we have powerful conversations to transform your life and your business. And today we have Cassie Wilson with us. Welcome, Cassie. Hi, Tanya. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate being here today. Thank you. I'm excited to go deeper. I know some things about you, of your journey, but not everything. So I'm going to ask you some questions to fill in the, the gaps here. I know you just came out with a new poetry book. Can you tell us a little bit of what the name of this new poetry book is and what your journey has been getting here? Yeah. So I have been a writer for about 10 years, but there was a long period of time where I wasn't sure what to write about or even, but I was trying to do more like self-help books. And then I have always enjoyed reading poetry. So I finally started writing more poetry and feeling like, okay, I can do this. Like I'm, I've been a big fan of like Mary Oliver and Maggie Smith, poets like that. So I finally started writing poems and decided I wanted to self-publish my first poetry book spring over a year ago. So then I had published my first book and then just came out with my second this last May. And the title is Fire and Flourishing. And it's a book of about 51 poems. And it's about courage. It's about flourishing through adversity. I explore themes of change, growth, grief, motherhood, love's resilience. A through line is a deep desire to rise above the status quo and flourish with a reignited passion for life. And we also moved out of California during peak wildfire season in 2020. So part of what really sparked these reflections and poems was that big change my family had when we moved out of the state and started uh, all new and fresh again in the Midwest. So we've been here now for three years and yeah. So I wanted to capture that in the form of a poetry book. So mm -hmm. that is amazing. Let's go back in, in time. So did the first book come out after you moved from California to the Midwest? It did. Yeah. yeah. So I've been a stay at home mom for most of my thirties and my, much of my focus was on my two boys. And, but I still had huge dreams inside my heart, like that probably kept growing and growing. And I needed a channel, like an artistic channel, a way to express myself. And I knew I also at the time, even though motherhood can be really fulfilling, I still had this like ache in my heart to pursue the dreams that mattered to me. So there was a long incubation period. So I could say in that time frame, I was still writing, but I wasn't sharing any of my work because I think two things. One, I was still learning what I wanted to write about, what mattered to me. Second, I think I was hiding behind my computer and a little afraid to, you know, put something out there because I don't think I've felt confident or strong enough in myself to really feel like what I would share was really my authentic message. So I think it took a long time for me to really feel like I had really something to say, to feel like I could stand behind my words in a confident way. So that was a journey that felt like it was a 10 year journey. So to answer roundabout way to answer your question, I finally, after we moved here, published my first book of poems all based on water and childhood wonder that is inspired from where I grew up in Minnesota. So that book came first. And I think that was the one that came first because that was the starting point for my life. But it was also the starting point for 
what I think has inspired me in every area of my life, that sense of wonder and, you know, faith in the beauty of the world. So that book came first. And then once that one was out of the way, it opened up this whole new excitement and energy to dive into a whole new topic. And so the first book is about the water element and the title is called Growing Gills. There's actually a poem in that where I transform into a mermaid. So I'm like standing on the threshold of coastal shores and the elements of nature start conspiring. And so I'm kind of swept up in waves and then I grow gills and then all the things I grow fins and, and then I dive really deep into the ocean. And part of what inspired that poem was this desire to go deeper in my life and to really see where I could go. And I think at that point, I didn't have a lot of faith in where I could go. So it was a, it was a big starting point for me that that was, and then fire and flourishing is like, you know, the fire element, like a lot of passion, heart, love, anger. You know, I get into topics like a little bit. I get into topics about rage and, you know, some depression because I, I went through a period of depression and I even get into like mental health. I get into my relationship with my, my husband and the wildfires we were experiencing within our marriage. And so when I first started this book of poems, I actually thought it was going to be more about my relationship, you know, with love and with my husband, but then it turned into so much more than that because it actually turned into more about like me and who I am and how I'm showing up in the world. And so this, this desire was like to challenge like my status quo, the places that I was getting way too comfortable and the familiarity of like having the same issues and getting stuck in the same way and really wanting to start challenging that and facing the fears that I had about diving into my potential. Wow. There's so many things that I can pull from this. I find that interesting that the first one was growing gills and it was all about water and both elements of nature. You know, you've mentioned how nature is important to you and that's, you know, you appreciate nature so much, you know, and the second one is all about fire, you know, and like the, another element of nature, very complete, very opposite. Tell me about poetry. Like, is it your way of self-expressing as you're going through things? Like where did the whole love for poetry and write, writing that way? Because I'm a person that journals. I don't express poetically. Maybe when I write in Spanish, I could go more because it's my main language, but I'm curious to hear about yourself. You know, like, are you expressing, like if you're getting in a moment of anger or if you're appreciating beauty, whether you went down to the lake or something like, how are you using poetry and where did this all start, Cassie? Yeah. So it did start from that initial love I had for the natural world when I was younger. And so much of what I interacted with nature. So I feel like my childhood was so different from what kids have today because I spent in the summers, you know, most of the day outside. So most of the day by the lake swimming, this lake by my house was about like 30 steps outside from my back door. So I could make it down to the water, a lot of playing in sand and like feeling the wind against my face. And so that initial love of being near water, the harmony that you feel when you're by the lake and all the things come together. It's the way the sunlight hits the water and the waves, the way that the wind moves the water to the shore. And so there was a natural rhythm, I think that was, you know, being that I was learning and experiencing, you know, as a kid. And then I think, you know, the language comes much later because as a kid, you're still learning, you know, all the words and you're, and often what we learn, is, you know, the words are so much bigger than what we can actually comprehend at the time. But I think I had everything inside that would eventually look for the words to be able to express what I think I experienced back then. And then my, the the relationship I still have with nature now. So even the rhythms of the seasons, I love the rhythms of the seasons and 
you can draw so much inspiration from that alone. So I haven't always been a reader, but really got more into reading as an adult and really just gravitated towards like philosophical poetry, you know, type books, like thinking about the big ideas of life and wonder and why we're here. So the poetry came, like the actual writing, it took me a long time to finally start for myself and feel like, okay, like, cause I didn't study this in school. So it's self-taught. So I had to read a lot I, I enjoyed it. So I would grab a poetry book and then now my bookshelf is full of them because I've read so many now. So I think that it took a lot of investigating the world of poetry myself to feel like I could get my own foothold hold inside of it and feel like I could uniquely express my own words and art form within it because everyone's going to have their own style. So, but you still need to know what's out there and learn from some of the the best writers to really be able to like hone in your own uh, skill and your own style. This is beautiful. How old are your kids now? They are 14 and 11. Okay. So they're still young. And because it's something that stood out that nature, like it's different how kids are growing up now where they can maybe not relate as much with nature. Cause as you were speaking all these things, I'm like, Oh my God, I can totally identify with her. You know, like to me, it's nature running around barefoot and all these things. Let's go deeper into that arena of the difference, you know, for us as moms and our kids that my daughter is the same as one of your kids. What's different. And can we still provide the nature versus technology and all these other things? Like, what have you been observing in your journey as a mom, you know, and seeing in that direction? That's certainly, I think moms these days, I think we're in a challenging time. I think we want our kids outside. (laughs) I really think that's the heart. We, the moms, we know they need that time outside. They need to learn who they are, you know, getting dirty, you know, getting scraped needs and having adventures. I actually think that's a starting point for learning to how to have courage is that, you know, you come across things that are uncertain or that is new to you as you're exploring in the natural world. And just by that experience of being outside, you can learn more about yourself. So like, I want my boys to go down to the Creek and just mess around, you know, and if something happens, something happens, but it's like, they're so close anyways. So it's like, they can always run home if there's a problem. But for me, it's really just trying to kick them out the door as much as I can is like kick them out the door. And then I think it's like, I try to limit screen time as much as I can, but that I find that that can be a challenge. So do your boys like going outdoors? Because I know there's kids that don't enjoy it. You know, like they'd rather be in more of a sterile environment, you know, where there's no bugs, they get freaked out, you know, how are your yeah, boys I don't, in that regard? I don't think mine aren't on that end of the spectrum. They do like being outside, but they have to be encouraged to like, I have to often you know, tell them why it's going to be fun, why they're going to enjoy themselves. And I think what's different for me is I I would do anything to be outside. So it was like, and I had a lot of freedom where I lived, where my parents just kind of gave me free reigns to do that, which is, was wonderful. But yeah, for them, it's more like, you know, if they want to play games, it's like, well, why don't you go outside for an hour first and go have, get some sunshine. And then when you come back in, you can play. So it's trying to, you know, postpone the tech, you know, hold it off so that what they're choosing initially is to spend more time outside. And you're lucky because you are in the Midwest, you know, like I feel like some people that live in big cities, I mean, I grew up in a big city. You were out in California for 12 years. Where were you? LA? I'm guessing one of the big- We we were in San Jose in the Bay Area. Okay. Yeah. In the Bay Area. So we had some nice parks by us. We were driving distance to the ocean. So I feel like they got to see some of the epic landscape, the redwoods, that, that sort of thing. But- The Bay Area is interesting because you can be in the Bay Area and it doesn't really feel like you're in California. It could almost be like you're anywhere because there's so many streets and neighborhoods and it's a sprawling suburb. So you have to find, I even found living in California, 
I had to prioritize getting outside and finding places to go, you know, with the boys. So let's take a quick pause and we'll come back to this. Hi there. I have something really cool for you. I want to give you free access to my signature course called Manifesting Abundance, which typically sells for $997. You can check out all the details in the show notes. All you have to do to gain access is leave me a review on Apple podcast, take a snapshot of it and send it to help period the courage to be at gmail.com and we'll get you set up with access to the course. You can also find other free goodies in the show notes. Go check them out. So let's go back to nature being your inspiration. You know, we're talking about nature with our kids, you know, and how we can start exposing them to it. And maybe they'll come back to it. You mentioned before that you didn't start becoming a reader until you were older. At what yeah. age did you start reading and how did that happen? Because I feel like sometimes we might get exposed to these things, but it just doesn't click for us until later. I was also a late bloomer with books. I did not start reading until college. Yeah. I think for me growing up in school, the books are your assigned books. And there's something about being assigned something that it makes you not want to read it. So I think, so I had to find the books that I was excited to read, to read. And I think it's important to just letting your kids get out, get to the library and find the books that they are attracted to, you know, so that they can pick what they like. But for, you know, for me, when I was younger, I don't think I went to the library enough. I didn't have a bookstore by me. So my parents really didn't have a lot of books in the house. So I think it was like a limit of access to books that I didn't have. I mean, we certainly had a Bible. I grew up in a really religious home. So, you know, I knew all the Bible stories and everything. But as far as like reading for me, it wasn't until after college that I started just having a hunger for knowledge. So it would be finding myself in the library and just grabbing books that stood out to me. And then, you know, I'd go home and read them and that kind of thing. And then the the poetry start at that point, like when you were looking for these kind of books or were you exposed to poetry, you know, like in your classes or something? Yeah, I, I did not get a lot, it, very much poetry at all in my like school education, maybe a little bit when I was younger, but it wasn't, you know, Actually, I do have an answer for this. I worked at a bookstore. So when my kids were ages seven and five, I worked at this really wonderful bookstore named Hickleby's. It's the only Hickleby's that exists in San Jose and in the world. And I just sold books to people. But what was so cool about working there is I was just surrounded by all these books and all this inspiration. So, and I was drawn to the poetry there, but it was so a lot of children's books actually have poetry in it. Like there's rhythm in, in children's books that sound poetic. So it was fun to explore that while I worked there. And then what was cool is my boys could come to the store and just kind of look around and explore. So that was another way that got my kids into reading. But for me, that's where I feel like my interest in poetry sparked was when I was working at the bookstore and then also just starting to finally read more poetry at that time and then take a stab at my own poems, which were really, really raw at first. You know, they, they weren't shareable at first. It took a while before, like, that was the breakthrough with my first poetry book is that it felt like these are, these were, these, the, I could share these with people. You know, anything I had written before wasn't really ready to, it wasn't ready for a reader. And let's talk about that process. So you start writing poetry. Do you carve out time on a daily basis? Do you do it when you're inspired with something? Do you go out in nature and write poetry? Like how, what's your process look like, Cassie? That's a good question. Part of it is just, it comes from inspiration. It comes from getting time outside and it just comes sometimes from an idea, like an idea about something to write about. And it could be from a personal experience. It could even just be a line, this line that pops in my head. And it sounds like it could be like the starting line of a poem. And then I'll take that line and I'll just see where it, where it takes me. And then when 
I've often found when I write a poem, I, I don't know where the poem's going to end. I don't know where it's going to land. And that's the fun part about it is it almost feels like you're discovering along the way and you find that this was there all along, but because you took a pen and you started writing, you discovered something. So one of the ways is inspiration. And then when it comes to getting a collection of poems together for a book, a lot of, a lot more discipline has to come into play a lot more like sitting down at the, at the desk and just getting the words out. And there's a lot of poems that didn't make it into my books. So that's another thing too, is there's a lot of throwaway poems. There's a lot of poems where it's like, where they weren't that good. So I'm just going to, they're not going to be a part of the collection. So there's definitely a lot of editing that comes into play when you're working on a poetry collection. So, and what made you go from just writing these poems that were not shareable, that were very raw to suddenly deciding and saying, I'm putting a book together and I'm self-publishing and now they're ready for not only to share with like maybe family and friends, but like I'm putting myself out there. I mean, that takes courage in itself. What was that turning point for you of wanting to take it public or put it, share it with the world? Yeah. So I would say it was that point in time in my life where I was tired of writing and having just, you know, piles of poems or, you know, saved documents on my computer just sitting there. So it came from this desire to finally feel like I might die if I don't share. Like I might, I might die if I don't share what I'm working on or what I'm doing. So yeah, it, it turned into a little life and death for me. I don't know if I'm getting a little drastic there, but it was a deep desire to finally bring something together and make it something that someone would enjoy reading. That's the best answer I can come up with right now. And going back to process for you, are you carving out time on a daily basis with it? You know, I'm just curious about your creative process with poetry, you know, and get, especially getting together for a book. Because I remember we had on the podcast, I think it's episodes 44 and 46, we had Mackenzie that talked about finding playfulness in your creativity as an adult with coloring books. And so she designs mm. all these things with coloring books. So if you're enjoying this episode with Cassie, definitely go listen to Mackenzie's. That's episode 46 and 44 was the courage of creativity and self-discovery with income, you know, like how to transform, because I think creativity is such an important process for us as human beings, you know, to self-express, you know, what's inside of us, whether it's poetry, whether it's visual art, whether it's a podcast, how do you choose to express yourself? And I'm so curious to hear your process. Like, mm -hmm. is it intentional? You know, like, okay, so some inspiration yeah. comes to you, but then do you just say every morning I allocate an hour to go out to the lake or to go for a walk in nature? Like, how do you commune? How do you connect? How does that process look like for you, Cassie? Because I'm sure there's listeners here that might have dreams or that creative side to them that they haven't really explored. Yeah. So as far as the process, I, I'd say for me, it's a little bit more spontaneous than having set hours every single week. When I got really serious about putting together these poetry collections, I was spending a lot of time in my week writing, editing, taking breaks, and then coming back to it again. My boys are both in, you know, I'd take that time when they're in school. So I'd have a chunk of like, you know, maybe three or four hours in the morning where I'd sit down at my desk and just get as much done as I could. But then you also have to fill the well of inspiration and then writing or being too disciplined can dry, dry out that well. So that's where those walks in nature really helped me. And there's a, a park not far from where I live where there's, it's just like a woods and trails. There's this pond I like to go sit by. And one of the poems I wrote in Growing Gills, it's, it's a total experience about sitting by this pond. And so some of the poems come from direct experiences in nature. And then some of the poems come from like 
a personal experience that somehow intertwines with the natural world that might be written at my desk, but it just varies depending on where the inspiration wants to take me. And do you carve out? So I get the part of the spontaneity and just kind of going with it too, instead of like, so yeah. like more rigid, you know, that someone could be like, no, I wake up every morning. I sit in front of, you know, the page and I wait until it comes. I'm just always so curious if the creative mind and, and the process and how people tap into it because we're all so different and yet certain commonalities. So for you to draw inspiration, do you car like carve out some time throughout the day? I mean, we know that you do it while the boys are at school. So yeah. note to self, anyone that's busy mom and <laughs> yeah. you need to carve that solo time, but what other tips or tricks could you give us to connect with our creative side? I mean, obviously just from hearing from you from the beginning to you, it's all nature. Like I know that you are a nature girl and you just, you, you draw a lot from nature. I can relate to that a hundred percent, but I'm curious, like, do you have to have a set like I have to go on a walk every day for at least half an hour by myself, like no kids, no nothing. Or do you like, I need to be surrounded by water. Or I need to take a bath. Like what are some of your techniques or some space, I guess, carving out that space to allow the inspiration to come through. Yeah. It always goes back to getting that walk in, in the morning. And the the morning time frame is my freshest time where I'm feeling more inspired. My brain feels more awake in the morning. So I know everyone has their creative hours that they choose. Some people are more creative at night. I tend to be more creative in the morning, you know, with a cup of coffee, cup of coffee next to me, but it's always nice to get vitamin D like a short, even if it's a short walk, a little bit of vitamin D. I take my dog on a walk and then I'll get coffee and I'll come and I'll sit down at my computer. It's really quiet, you know, where I am. So that's always really nice. But as far as like diving into your own creativity and your own like techniques as a person, I think those are things we learn once we start exploring that for ourselves. So what might work for me might not work for somebody else. Someone might need more discipline than me. I need a little bit of both. I need the inspiration, the spontaneity, the discipline, definitely as I'm finishing a book and getting it published and everything that all came into play. But as far as techniques, I would say just continue to read, continue to follow what inspires you, continue to dream, continue to dream. This is great. And the walks in the morning, do you do them first thing in the morning? Like around what time do you go for your walks? Yeah. It's usually like a 20 minute walk just around my neighborhood. We live on a, this really wooded tree line street. The, the river's kind of by us. So I, I don't typically go that far down to the river because it's a little ways but it's a really scenic neighborhood. So it's really beautiful. And, and then if I really need just to get out of where I live, cause I'm not too far from the city. I'm about, you know, you know, 20, 25 minutes from the city itself. So, and I live in a little like village area, it's called a village, but it's a town. And to get more out into nature, I have to drive because I'm still still too close to the city where I am. So if I really need some more, just a break from where I'm at, I take that drive to my favorite park that has the woods and the ponds and I can hear the birds there and everything. So, and do you do that before not the driving up at your morning walks before the kids get up? It's typically after drop off because mm -hmm. their schedule so early as it is. So it's typically after they're like dropped off at school. And then, you know, summer's different because they're home and that's definitely different. And I'm also taking a break from jumping into a new book. I'm just not putting that pressure on myself right now. So I'm not writing as much right now. I'm more journaling or reading, but I'm not doing anything right now to the poems come every once in a while. And I've written a few since publishing this book, but I'm still, I'm taking a bigger break this time from before I dive into something new. With the summer. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, that makes total sense. Let's go back to the, when you were talking about the second book, the one that you just got out, Fire and Flourishing, 
you're talking about heart, love, anger, rage, mental illnesses, mental health. What, what do you like to share about that that came out that you were not expecting? That's a really good question. When you start a project like this, like when I started this project, I didn't know where it would take me. I had the initial ideas of what I thought it would be. And then there was so many curve balls or like plot twists that ended up happening in this book. And part of what I ended up talking about was fear. So like facing your fears and somehow that came out of this and the inner critic inside. So there is some mental illness that is prevalent in my family background. And there was a few poems that came out where my grandma had schizophrenia. So she's, she's a woman that I knew, but she wasn't well and she couldn't be present with you. So it was interesting as a child observing her struggle, but not having the words to process it or having people in your life that were helping you process it. So part of what I explored in this book was facing your fears and your inner critic. And so the my grandma could hear voices in her head. And so I actually have a poem called Staring Down Fear, where I talk, I relate to my grandmother's story, though, though I don't have a story like hers at all. She is a woman who wasn't able to live her dreams. She's a woman that lived out her days in a mental institution. So I found that I ended up having a lot of compassion for her. And I was surprised because I'm, I'm like, where did this come from? I barely knew her, but it's more the mystery of her life and that the maternal lineage that was passed down to me and feeling some kind of deeper connection with that. And so I compare her hearing voices in her head to the inner critic that we have inside our own head, because in, in our, in our own way, we all hear voices in our head, but ours are just like the inner critic that tries to keep us small, that tries to hold us back from doing the things that we know would be good for us. So there was a poem where I connected our stories and that was a really interesting, I did not expect that happening. So it was interesting to find, to see that come about. That's fabulous. Thank you for sharing that story. What emerged from that of how do you handle your inner critics. Yeah, I I would have to say for me, recognizing that we all have obstacles in life. We all have obstacles from getting from, you know, point A to point B. But for me, like, that's my biggest obstacle. It, It is my inner critic. It is the voice in my head that is comfortable with my fears because my fears are predictable. But I think that our dreams are calling us beyond our fears. Our dreams are calling us beyond where we currently are. And I actually think our dreams are in the business of changing us and transforming us, if that that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And so do you have a conversation with your inner critics? Like how do you tap into those dreams to overcome that inner critic voice being that bigger obstacle for us? So how do I overcome my inner critic or how do yeah. I face my inner critic? Yeah. To get to the dream, like even just writing the poetry books, you know, you could have just kept those to yourself and like, let me just stay comfortable here. I don't need to do anything else. I'm sure there's the inner critic there talking to you like, no, don't put it out there. People are going to hate it. You're not, who do you think you are? You're not good enough. And it's funny because our inner critics tend to overlap. Like if we really gave them voice out loud and we all shared, they're going to be very similar. The things that they're telling ourselves, I'm sure your inner critic and mine are very similar, Cassie. Yeah. Yeah. And I think our inner critic actually somehow is taking cues from our fears. So it's those worries, those anxieties, those fears that we have, those are the voices of the inner critic. And when you're young and you're starting out, when you're newly starting out in a dream or a creative pursuit, Those voices can be really loud because you haven't been tested yet, but you don't know your own grit. You don't know your own, really your own talents and your own gift that you're trying to bring to the world. So there's a underdeveloped side to ourselves that can really fall prey 
to the inner critic, to the inner critic inside. So that's why having faith in what you're doing, having belief in yourself and what you're doing to see it through to the finish line. And because there's going to be a lot of things that try to knock you off that, but the most challenging will be that inner critic, the inner critic inside that wants to keep you right where you are, because there's something safer. There's something more comfortable about staying where you are. And our dreams really are in the business of changing us. Our dreams are in the business of transforming our character, our talent, our skills, our endurance. So when I think about my dreams too, like we can often think about the impact we want to make in the world how we want to change something or or make something better in the world. And I actually think like that can come later, but I think uh, definitely for new people that are starting out in a dream pursuit, think more about how doing this dream, pursuing this dream is going to change you because that is really what your dream wants to do. It wants to first change you before you make an impact externally. How has your dream of writing poetry changed? It has given me confidence in ways I couldn't have imagined, but I feel like it's just the beginning because I still feel like I'm learning how to step out more and more and more. It's helping me realize there's more potential in me that I've been too afraid to tap into, but now want to tap into. It's fun and it's exciting. I think that's the, 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 the best thing that's come out of it is I'm finding so much joy writing poems, sharing them, learning how to publish, getting my words out in the world. Like it's become a really fun thing that lights me up. So it's the combination of joy, combination of confidence, combination of connecting with other people. Because I think that's part of it too, is that as writers, we're connecting our inner and outer lives But we're also trying to connect with a reader. We're trying to connect with people, with community, with a common thing that we can share about. So writing can feel like a very solitary practice. But at the end of the day, it's more than that because it becomes a way to connect with our outer world and with people that we come across. That's beautiful. So do you feel that by having the courage and stepping in and overcoming those fears and those obstacles that show up, you get to be rewarded with all these other amazing things. Yeah. So that's the cool thing about it is you don't, when you start out your dream, you don't know where it's going to lead you. And it often leads you, I think, to better pastures than you first realized. So, and the rewards end up being connecting with people, like connecting your heart, connecting with somebody else's heart. And when, especially when you're writing a book, you're thinking about and publishing, you're thinking about, oh, I want to sell this book. I want to make money. I need to market it. And all that is involved. The outcome and the results, we really don't have control over how that comes about. But the coolest reward really is connecting with other people's hearts, I'd say, and finding a way to empower others, encourage others, show people more love. Like, yeah. So this has been fabulous, Cassie. Thank you for this because you're right. It's the bottom line. It's almost like the heart to heart connection. You know, it's like, whether that's coming through poetry visual arts through music, you know, and whatever way that you can express yourself as a human being and simultaneously with the work that you create with that self-expression, being able to connect, you know, with others. I love that. This is great. I'm so excited and get to listen to some of your poetry too. Find (laughs) us one of your poems. I'm looking forward to hearing it and sharing with us. So I'm going to start with the poem called The Chasm. And this poem is, the chasm is a metaphor for the barrier in our way from the barrier that's in our mind, from where we are and where we want to go. So that's how I'm going to start this out. So the chasm. My dreams appear distant, gaping chasm up ahead between the place I was and where I wanted to go. 
doubting if I had the talent, the know-how to make a way across. Seasons came and went. My wishing turned to daydreams, musings of the mind. Maybe when dreams are not pursued, they go dormant as foliage, wither in the dead of winter, and life in all its color loses luster. Maybe it's better like this, still hoping to be known for who I am. But how could I know myself being stuck in the same place? Looking over its ledge, the chasm echoed back my fears. I tried ignoring it with the whims of the day, its many demands, checking off lists, every little task, waking sleepily to the next day while I groaned, there must be more. Toyed with an image of myself, risk adverse, self-limitation kept me tightly wound. It could have stayed like this, yet one chance day, the winds blew carrying a gentle whisper. In a moment, I muster the courage to leap. To my surprise, I grow wings fierce as fire. Mm, that was beautiful. Thank you for that. Tell me, where can people find you? They can find me at... The best way would be Instagram. I use Instagram okay. a lot. I share my poems there. My handle is at Cassie Wilson Poet. It's spelled K-A-S-S-I-W-I-L-S-O-N-P-O-E-T at Cassie Wilson Poet. Perfect. And I like ending with this question, which is, what would you say to our audience that's one thing they could do to live a life with more courage. I think facing your fears. If I have to say one thing, it would be identifying what they even are. Because when we don't know what they are, subconsciously, they can have more influence over our lives. So I think having the vulnerable conversations with yourself and with loved ones, leaning into vulnerability whether that's journaling, really getting honest on the page. If you have a spouse, talking to your spouse about what your fears are, what your dreams are. And the reason I say fears is because when you name your fears, you actually realize what matters to you most. Because if those fears come true, you actually see that there's, there's loss and there's risk to not living out your dreams and doing the things that really matter to you. So, you know, one of my fears that I identified with is this idea that I would live my life and not truly live out my real, live out my purpose, live out what's on my heart and do those things that matter to me. So part of, so part of it was this, it was about the person I wanted to become in the process of pursuing my dreams and knowing this person inside of me that's there, but I'm not going to know who she is if I'm staying on the safe side of life. So it's this desire to take risks, to get out there. So my advice for, you know, anyone listening is to write down your fears and it will tell you what matters to you, which will in turn reveal what your dreams might even be in the first place. That's beautiful. Thank you for that, Cassie. Well, thanks for your time with us today. Thanks for your wisdom. Thanks for sharing. And to be continued, we're going to do our little masterclass mentorship class. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi there. I have something really cool for you. I want to give you free access to my signature course called Manifesting Abundance, which typically sells for $997. You can check out all the details in the show notes, and all you have to do to gain access is leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, take a snapshot of it, and send it to help, period, the courage to be at gmail.com, and we'll get you set up with access to the course. 